identity and individuality in quantum theory. What are the metaphysical implications of quantum physics? One way of approaching this question is to consider the impact of the theory on understanding of objects as individuals with well-defined identity conditions. According to the received view, which was elaborated as the quantum revolution was taking place, quantum theory implies that the fundamental particles of physics cannot be regarded as individual objects in this sense. Such a view has motivated the development of non-standard formal systems which are appropriate for representing non-individual objects. However, it has also been argued that quantum physics is in fact compatible with the metaphysics of individual objects, but that such objects are indistinguishable in a sense which leads to the violation of Leibniz's famous principle of the identity of indiscernibles. This last claim has also been contested, opening up a further way of understanding the individuality of quantum entities. As a result, we are faced with a form of underdetermination of the relevant metaphysics by the physics, in which we have, on the one hand, quantum objects as individuals, and on the other, quantum objects as non-individuals. It has been argued that this underdetermination of such fundamental metaphysical packages has important implications for the realism and realism debate. 1. Introduction. It is typically held that chairs, trees, rocks, people, and many of the so-called everyday objects we encounter can be regarded as individuals. The issue then is how this individuality is to be understood, or what constitutes the principle of individuality. This is an issue which has a very long history in philosophy. A number of approaches to it can be broadly delineated. We might begin by noting that a tree and rock, say, can be distinguished in terms of their different properties. We might then go further and insist that this also forms the basis for ascribing individuality to them. Even two apparently very similar objects, such as two coins of the same denomination or so-called identical twins, will display some differences in their properties, a scratch here, a scar there, and so on. On this account, such differences are sufficient to both distinguish and individuate the objects. This undergirds the so-called bundle view of objects, according to which an object is nothing but a bundle of properties. In order to guarantee individuation, no two objects can then be absolutely indistinguishable or indiscernible in the sense of possessing exactly the same set of properties. This last claim has been expressed as the principle of identity of indiscernibles, and it ensures the individuality of the objects that fall under its scope. We shall return to it below. However, this approach has been criticized on the grounds, among others, that we can surely conceive of two absolutely indistinguishable objects. Thinking of Star Trek, we could imagine a replicator device which precisely reproduces an object, such as a coin or even a person, giving two such objects exactly the same set of properties. Not quite, one might respond, since these two objects do not and indeed cannot exist at the same place at the same time, that is, they do not possess the same spatial temporal properties. In terms of these properties, then, the objects can, can still be distinguished and hence regarded as different individuals. Clearly, then, this approach to the issue of individuality must be underpinned by the assumption that individual objects are impenetrable. A more thoroughgoing criticism of this property based approach to individuality insists that it conflates epistemological issues concerning how we distinguish objects with ontological issues concerning the metaphysical basis of individuality. Thus, it is argued, to talk of distinguishability requires at least two objects, but we can imagine a universe in which there exists only one. In such a situation, it is claimed, it would be inappropriate to say that the object is distinguishable, but not that it is an individual. Although we do not actually find ourselves in such situations, of course, still, it is insisted, distinguishability and individuality should be kept conceptually distinct. If this line of argument is accepted, then the principle of individuality must be sought in something over and above the properties of an object. One candidate is the notion of substance in which properties are taken to inhere in some way. Locke famously describes substance as a something, we know not what, since to describe it we would have to talk of its properties, but bare substance, by its very nature, has no properties itself. Alternatively, the individuality of an object has been expressed in terms of its hachiety or primitiveness, Adams 1979. As the name suggests, this is taken to be the primitive basis of individuality, which cannot be analyzed further. However, it has also been identified with the notion of self-identity, understood as a relational property, Adam Zibbid, and expressed more formally as a equals a. Each individual is understood to be identical to itself. This may seem like a form of the property-based property -based approach we started with, but self-identity is a rather peculiar kind of property. As we'll see, denying that quantum objects are self-identical may be one way of capturing the idea that they are not individuals. This is just a sketch of some of the various positions that have been adopted. There has been considerable debate over which of them applies to the everyday objects mentioned above. But at least it is generally agreed that such objects should be regarded as individuals to begin with. What about the fundamental objects posited by current physical theories, such as electrons, protons, neutrons, etc.? Can these be regarded as individuals? One response is that they cannot, since they behave very differently in aggregates from classical individuals. 2. Quantum non-individuality. The argument for the above conclusion, that the fundamental objects of physics cannot be regarded as individuals, can be summed up as follows. First of all, both classical and quantal objects of the same kind, e.g. electrons, can be regarded as indistinguishable in the sense of possessing the same intrinsic properties, such as rest mass, charge, spin, etc. Consider now the distribution of two such indistinguishable particles over two boxes, or two states in general. Two boxes side by side, two circles in the first box. One. Two boxes side by side, two circles in the second box. Two. Two boxes side by side, one circle in each box. Three. Figure. In classical physics, three is given a weight of twice that of one or two, corresponding to the two ways the former can be achieved by permuting the particles. This gives us four combinations or complexions in total, and hence we can conclude that the probability of finding one particle in each state, for example, is one half. Note that it is assumed that none of the four combinations is regarded as privileged in any way, so each is just as likely to occur. This is an example of the well-known Maxwell-Boltzmann statistics to which it is claimed thermodynamics was reduced at the turn of the 20th century. In quantum statistical mechanics, however, we have two standard forms: one for which there are three possible arrangements in the above situation, both particles in one box, both particles in the other, and one in each box, giving Bose-Einstein statistics, and one for which there is only one arrangement, one particle in each box, giving Fermi-Dirac statistics, which underpins the Pauli exclusion principle and all that entails. Setting aside the differences between these two kinds of quantum statistics, the important point for the present discussion is that in the quantum case, a permutation of the particles is not regarded as giving rise to a new arrangement. This result lies at the very heart of quantum physics. Putting things slightly more formally, it is expressed by the so-called indistinguishability postulate. If a particle permutation p is applied to any state function for an assembly of particles, then there is no way of distinguishing the resulting permuted state function from the original unpermuted one by means of any observation at any time. The state function of quantum mechanics determines the probability of measurement results. Hence, what the indistinguishability postulate expresses is that a particle permutation does not lead to any difference in the probabilities for measurement outcomes. The argument then continues as follows: that a permutation of the particles is counted as giving a different arrangement in classical statistical mechanics implies that, although they are indistinguishable, such particles can be regarded as individuals. Indeed, Boltzmann himself made this explicit in the first axiom of his lectures on mechanics, couched in terms of the impenetrability assumption noted above. Since this individuality resides in something over and above the intrinsic properties of the particles in terms of which they can be regarded as indistinguishable, it has been called transcendental individuality by Post, 1963. This notion can be cashed out in various well-known ways, as indicated in the introduction above, in terms of some kind of underlying Lockean substance, for example, or in terms of primitiveness. More generally, one might approach it in modal fashion through the doctrine of Hakeyitism. This asserts that two possible worlds may describe some individual in qualitatively the same way, that is, as possessing the same set of properties, yet represent the individual differently by ascribing a different Hakeyity or thisness in each world, or more generally, by ascribing some non-qualitative aspect to the individual. Lewis, 1986, Huggett, 1999a. Conversely, it is argued if such permutations are not counted in quantum statistics, it follows that quantum objects cannot be regarded as individuals in any of these senses. Post 1963. In other words, they are very different from most everyday objects in that they
The possibility that one of the identical twins Mike and Ike is in the quantum state E1 and the other in the quantum state E2 does not include two differential cases which are permuted on permuting Mike and Ike. It is impossible for either of these individuals to retain his identity so that one of them will always be able to say I'm Mike and the other I'm Mike. Even in principle one cannot demand an alibi of an electron. Well, 1931. Recalling the discussion sketched in the introduction, if we were to create a twin using some kind of Star Trek replicator, say, then in the classical domain such a twin could insist that I'm here and she's there, or more generally, I'm in this state and she's in that one and swapping us over makes a difference. In the classical domain each, indistinguishable, twin has a metaphysical alibi grounded in their individuality. Whale's point is that in quantum mechanics, they do not. 3. Quantum individuality. This conclusion, that quantal objects are not individuals, is not the whole story, however. First of all, the contrast between classical and quantum physics with regard to individuality and non-individuality is not as straightforward as it might seem. As already indicated, the above account involving permutations of particles and boxes appears to fit nicely with an understanding of individuality in terms of Lockean substance or primitiveness. However, one can give an alternative field theoretic account in which particles are represented as dichotomic yes slash no fields. With such a field, the field amplitude is simply yes at location x if the particle is present at x and no if it is not. Redhead 1983. On this account, individuality is conferred via spatiotemporal location together with the assumption of impenetrability mentioned in the intro introduction. Thus, the above account of particle individuality in terms of either Lockean substance or primitive business is not necessary for classical statistical mechanics. The particles and boxes picture above corresponds to the physicist's multidimensional phase space, which describes which individuals have which properties, whereas the field theoretic representation corresponds to distribution space, which simply describes which properties are instantiated in what numbers. Huggett has pointed out that the former supports Hakeyitism, whereas the latter does not and and, furthermore, that the empirical evidence provides no basis for choosing between these two spaces, Huggett 1999a. Thus the claim that classical statistical mechanics is wedded to Hakeyitism also becomes suspect. Secondly, the above argument from permutations can be considered from a radically different perspective. In the classical case the situations with one particle in each box are given a weight of two in the counting of possible arrangements. In the case of quantum statistics the situation is given a weight of one. With this weighting, there are two possible statistics, as we noted, Bose-Einstein, corresponding to a symmetric state function for the assembly of particles in Fermi-Dirac, corresponding to an anti-symmetric state function. Given the indistinguishability postulate, it can be shown that symmetric state functions will always remain symmetric and anti-symmetric always anti-symmetric. Thus, if the initial condition is imposed that the state of the system is either symmetric or anti-symmetric, then only one of the two possibilities, Bose-Einstein or Fermi-Dirac, is ever available to the system, and this explains why the weighting assigned to one particle in each state is half the classical value. This gives us an alternative way of understanding the difference between classical and quantum statistics, not in terms of the lack of individuality of the objects, but rather in terms of which states are accessible to them. French 1989. In other words, the implication of the different counting in quantum statistics can be understood as not that the objects are not individuals in some sense, but that there are different sets of states available to them, compared to the classical case. On this view, the objects can still be regarded as individuals, with the issue remaining as to how that individuality is to be cashed out. Both of these perspectives raise interesting and distinct metaphysical issues for a useful introduction see Castellani 1998b. Let us consider, first, the objects as individuals package. How is the relevant notion of individuality to be articulated? One option would be to take one of the traditional lines and ground it some form of primitiveness or Lockean substance. However, this kind of metaphysics is anathema to many of a naturalistic persuasion, not least because it lies beyond the physical pale, as it were. Alternatively, one might take individuality to be primitive, but then assuage any naturalistic tendencies by tying it to the idea of countability, in the sense that we can always count how many quantum objects are in a given state, and take the latter to be both physically significant and capable of being read off from the theory, Dorado and Morgani 2013. Nevertheless, it may be felt that naturalism is better satisfied by eschewing such primitivist moves and taking the individuality of the objects to be reducible to their discernibility and ground the latter in their properties, as presented by the theory, a feeling that may be further supported by doubts as to the physical plausibility of possible worlds containing only one object, as mentioned above. Of course, for this to work, we need some assurance that no two objects are indiscernible or indistinguishable in the relevant sense. Traditionally, this assurance has been provided by Leibniz, Leibniz's famous principle of the identity of indiscernibles, so let us consider the status of this principle in the context of modern physics. For quantum physics and the identity of indiscernibles. Now, of course, both quantum and classical objects of the same kind, such as electrons, say, are indistinguishable in the sense that they possess all intrinsic properties, charge, spin, rest mass, etc., in common. However, quantum objects are indistinguishable in a much stronger sense in that it is not just that two or more electrons possess the same intrinsic properties, but that, on the standard understanding, no measurement whatsoever could in principle determine which one is which. If the non-intrinsic, state-dependent properties are identified with all the monadic or relational properties which can be expressed in terms of physical magnitude standardly associated with self-adjoint operators that can be defined for the objects, then it can be shown that two bosons or two fermions in a joint symmetric or anti-symmetric state respectively have the same monadic properties and the same relational properties one to another. French and Redhead 1988. See also Butterfield 1993. 1993. This has immediate implications for the principle of the identity of indiscernibles which, expressed crudely, insists that two things which are indiscernible must be, in fact, identical. Setting aside the historical issue of Leibniz's own attitude towards his principle, see, for example, Rodriguez Barrera 2014, supporters of it have tended to retreat from the claim that it is necessary and have adopted the alternative view that it is at least contingently true in the face of apparent counterexamples such as possible worlds containing just two indistinguishable spheres. There is the further issue as to how the principle should be characterized, and in particular, there is the question of what properties are to be included within the scope of those relevant to judgments of indiscernibility. Excluding the property of self identity, which again, we'll come back to below, three forms of the principle can be broadly distinguished according to the properties involved. The weakest form, PII1, states that it is not possible for two individuals to possess all properties and relations in common. The next strongest, PII2, excludes spatial temporal properties from this description, and the strongest form, PII3, includes only monadic, non relational properties. properties. Thus, for example, PII3 is the claim that no two individuals can possess all the same monadic properties, a strong claim indeed, although it is one way of understanding Leibniz's own view. In fact, PII2 and PII3 are clearly violated in classical physics, where distinct particles of the same kind are typically regarded as indistinguishable in the sense of possessing all intrinsic properties in common, and such properties are regarded as non relational in general and non spatial temporal in particular. Of course, Leibniz himself would not have been perturbed by this result, since he took the principle of identity of indiscernibles to ultimately apply only to monads, which were the fundamental entities of his ontology. Physical objects such as particles were regarded by him as nearly well founded phenomena. Dot. However, PII1 is not violated classically, since classical statistical mechanics typically assumes that such particles are impenetrable in precisely the sense that their spatial temporal trajectories cannot overlap. Hence they can be individuated via their spatial temporal properties, as indicated above. The situation appears to be very different in quantum mechanics, however. If the particles are taken to possess both their intrinsic and state dependent properties in common, as suggested above, then there is a sense in which even the weakest form of the principle PII1 fails, Cortes 1976, Teller 1983, French and Redhead 1988, for an alternative view, see Van Fressen 1985 and 1991. On this understanding, the principle of identity of indiscernibles is actually false. Hence it cannot be used to effectively guarantee individuation via the state dependent properties by analogy with the classical case. If one wishes to maintain that quantum particles are individuals, then their individuality will have to be taken as conferred by Lockean substance, primitive business, or in general, some form of non qualitative hegeistic
However, this argument only applies to monadic, state-dependent properties, and so the above conclusion still hold, holds for PII2 and PII3. In effect, what has been shown is that those versions of PII, which allow relations to individuate, are not the weakest forms of the principle, but the only forms which are applicable. This shift to relations as individuating elements has led to the development of a form of PII, based on Quine's suggestions about discernibility, which allows objects to be weakly discernible in relational terms, Saunders 2003A and 2006, for a useful overview see Bygosh 2015A. Consider, for example, two fermions in a spherically symmetric singlet state. The fermions are not only indistinguishable in the above sense, but also possess exactly the same set of spatiotemporal properties and relations. However, each enters into the symmetric but irreflexive relation of having opposite direction of each component of spin to, on the basis of which they can be said to be weakly discernible for general discussions of different kinds of discernibility. See Colton and Butterfield 2012a, Bygosh 2014, Ketland 2011, Ladyman, Lenebo, and Pettigrew 2012. If we extend PII to incorporate such relations, the principle can, it seems, be made compatible with quantum physics, and the individuality of the fermions can be grounded in these irreflexive relations without having to appeal to anything like primitiveness. This result has also been extended to bosons, Muller and Saunders 2008, Muller and Seeding 2009, although some of the details are contentious, in particular with regard to the interpretation of some of the mathematical features that are appealed to in this account. See Bygosh 2015a and 2015b, Colton 2013, Huggett and Norton 2014, Norton 2015. In addition to such technical issues, there is the further philosophical concern that the appeal to irreflexive relations in order to ground the individuality of the objects which bear such relations involves a circularity. In order to appeal to such relations, one has had to already individuate the particles which are so related, and the numerical diversity of the particles has been presupposed by the relation which hence cannot account for it. See French and Krauss 2006, Holly 2006 and 2009. One response to this worry would be to question the underlying assumption that relata must have the relevant ontological priority over relations and adopt some form of structuralist view of objects according to which the relata are eliminable in terms of relations, perhaps emerging, in some sense as intersections of them, or, more mildly perhaps, argue that neither a recorded priority, but comes a package, as it were, for further discussion. See French 2014. It has been suggested, for example, that this whole discussion of weak discernibility reveals a category of entity that has received little attention so far, namely that of relationals, objects that can be discerned by means of relations only. Muller 2011, 2015. I shall return to the structuralist perspective below, but for an alternative, coherentist account, see Colossi and Morgani 2018. More generally, however, it has been argued that this whole debate is orthogonal to that over the status of PII since what weak discernibility grounds is nearly numerical distinctness, rather than the robust sense of discernibility that PII was originally concerned with, Ladyman and Bygodge 2010. The latter involves some sense of difference over and above numerical distinctness, but weakly discernible relations such as having opposite direction of each component of spin to do not provide this. Hence, it is claimed, PII remains violated by quantum mechanics, although see Freed 2014, where the principle is defended in the context of a specific understanding of quantum entanglement. The above considerations are typically presented within the orthodox interpretation of quantum mechanics, but there are a further set of responses which step outside of this. Thus Van Frassen, for example, Van Frassen 1985 and 1991, has advocated a form of modal interpretation, in the context of which, standard, PII can be retained. At the core of this approach lies a distinction between two kinds of state, the value state, which is specified by stating which observables have values, and what they are, and the dynamic state, which is specified by stating how the system will develop both if isolated and if acted upon in some definite fashion. The evolution of the latter is deterministic, in accordance with Schrodinger's equation, but the value state changes unpredictably, within the limits set by the dynamic state, for criticism see some of the papers in Deeks and Vermas 1998. Because the actual values of observables do not increase, increase predictive power, if added to the relevant dynamic state description, they are deemed to be empirically superfluous. In the case of fermions, at least, distinct value states can be assigned to each particle and PII saved. However, concerns have been raised over the objectivity of such value state attributions, mass semiopsis, P, 318, FN11, and one might regard the associated empirically superfluous properties as merely conceptual. This bears again on the important issue of what kinds of properties may be admitted to lie within the scope of the principle. Clearly some would appear to be beyond the pale, saving PII by regarding the particle labels themselves as intrinsic properties is surely unacceptable. Furthermore, bosons must be treated differently, since they can have the same dynamic and value states. In this case, Van Frassen suggests that each boson is individuated by its history, where this is again to be understood as empirically superfluous. Of course, it might seem odd that an approach which originally, which originally sought to avoid the grounding of the individuality of objects in something like Lockean substance should find itself having to include empirically superfluous factors within the scope of PII. Another unorthodox approach incorporates the Bohmian interpretation of quantum mechanics, and in particular, it has been suggested that it might form the basis of an alternative conception of particle individuality in terms of their spatiotemporal trajectories. As is well known, attributing distinguishing spatiotemporal trajectories to quantum objects faces acute difficulties under the orthodox interpretation of quantum mechanics. On the Bohm interpretation, however, they are allowed, indeed, the only observable admitted is that of position. What this interpretation gives us is a dual ontology of point particles plus pilot wave, where the role of the latter is to determine the instantaneous velocities of the former through the so-called guidance equations. These complete the standard formulation of quantum mechanics so that, in addition to the quantum state, whose development is determined by the Schrodinger equation, there is also a set of single particle trajectories, each of which is determined by the guidance equation, plus the initial positions of the particles, for a review see Cushing et al. 1996. Such an interpretation appears to provide a natural home for the metaphysical package which takes quantum objects to be individuals, see, for example, Brown et al. 1999, and indeed, a form of PII1 can now be defended against the above conclusion. Nevertheless, things are not quite as straightforward as they might seem. It has been argued that intrinsic properties cannot be considered as pos possessed solely by the objects, but in some sense must be assigned to the pilot wave as well, Brown et al. 1994. Thus, again, there is an ontological cost involved in retaining this view of objects as individuals. What if one were to consider the evolution of the system concerned in the multidimensional configuration space in terms of which the wave function must be described? Here, the implications of considering particle permutations are encoded in the topology of such a space by identifying points corresponding to such a permutation, and thereby constructing what is known as the reduced configuration space formed by the action of the permutation group on the full configuration space. As in the case of ordinary spacetime, some form of impenetrability assumption must be adopted to ensure that, in the case of those particles that are not bosons at least, no two particles occupy the same point of this reduced space. Here, Bohmian mechanics offers some advantage. It turns out that the guidance equations ensure the non coincidence of the relevant particle trajectories. Brown et al. 1999. In effect, impenetrability is built into the dynamics, and thus the configuration space approach and the Broibohm interpretation fit nicely together. Returning to the core point, one can maintain that quantum objects are individuals, even granted the implications of quantum statistics. And one can either take that individuality to be ungrounded and primitive or grounded in some form of primitive business, or more plausibly for many, in the associated properties via an updated and extended form of PII criticisms and concerns notwithstanding. However, there is also the alternative, articulated during the throes of the quantum revolution itself, as noted above, which is to take quantum objects to be non individuals in some sense. Of course, if this alternative metaphysical package is adopted, then Leibniz's principle simply does not apply. Apply. But now the obvious question arises what sense can we make of this notion of non individuality? 5. Non individuality and self identity. Let us recall Whale's statement that one can't ask alibis of electrons. Dalekiara and Toraldo di Francia refer to quantum physics as the land of anonymity, in the sense that, on this view, the objects cannot be uniquely labeled, 1993 and 1995. They ask, then, how can we talk about what happens in such a land? Their suggestion is that quantum objects
This suggestion can be found most prominently in the philosophical reflections of Born, Schrodinger, Hesse, and Post. Born 1943, Schrodinger 1952, Hesse 1963, Post 1963. It is immediately and clearly problematic, however. How can we have objects that are not identical to themselves? Such self-identity seems bound up with the very notion of objecthood in the sense that it is an essential part of what it is to be that object. Thus it has been suggested that non-individuality might be better understood in terms of the loss of patio-temporal trajectories in quantum physics. Physics. C. Ehrenhardt, Bueno and Krauss, 2019. This intuition is summed up in the Quinian slogan, No Entity Without Identity, Quine 1969, with all its attendant consequences regarding reference, etc. However, Mark and Marcus has offered an alternative perspective, insisting on no identity without entity. Marcus 1993, and arguing that although, all terms may refer to objects, not all objects are things, or a thing is at least that about which it is appropriate to assert the identity relation. Ibid P. 25, object reference then becomes a wider notion than thing reference. Within such a framework, we can then begin to get a formal grip on the notion of objects which are not self-identical through so-called Schrodinger logics, introduced by Da Costa, Da Costa, and Krauss 1994. These are many sorted logics in which the expression x equals y is not a well-formed formula in general. It is where x and y are one sort of term, but not for the other sort corresponding to quantum objects. A semantics for such logics can be given in terms of quasi-sets, Da Costa, and Krauss 1997. The motivation behind such developments is the idea that collections of quantum objects cannot be considered as sets in the usual Cantorian sense of collections into a whole of definite, distinct objects of our intuition or of our thought. Cantor 1955, p. 85. Quasi-set theory incorporates two kinds of basic posits or element, m atoms, whose intended interpretation are the quantum objects and m atoms, which stand for the everyday objects and which fall within the remit of classical set theory with your elements. Quasi sets are then the collections obtained by applying the usual Sermelo Frankel framework plus your elements ZFU like axioms to a basic domain com composed of M atoms, M atoms, and aggregates of them. Krauss 1992. For a comparison of quasi theory with quasi set theory, see Dalakara, Juntini, and Krauss 1998. These developments apply to the beginnings of a categorial framework for quantum non individuality, which, it is claimed, helps to articulate this notion and, bluntly, make it philosophically respectable. Extensive details are given in French in Krauss 2006. See also Ehrenhardt 2012. Dominac and Holick 2007. Dominac, Holick and Krauss 2008. Krauss 2010. Crucially, within this formal framework, a sense of countability is retained in that collections of quantum entities possess a kind of cardinality, but not an ordinality, so we can, in effect, say how many objects there are, even though we cannot place them in numerical order. Critical discussions of both these formal details and of the basis for attributing non-individuality to quantum objects can be found in Bueno ET. L. 2011 and Santa Ana 2019. Much of this criticism has proceeded on the basis of insisting that we do not need to adopt such an apparently radical approach. Thus advocates of weak discernibility, discussed above, have argued that this notion yields an appropriately naturalist sense of individuality, suitable for quantum physics, whereas Dorado and Morganti, 2013, insist, as already noted, that one can retain countability and individuality as primitive notions and that this is to be preferred over any shift to non-individuality. For a response to the latter in defense of the above formal framework, see Ehrenhardt and Krauss 2014. Jensen, on the other hand, has argued that identity and cardinality are tied together as a matter of meaning rather than metaphysics and that, consequently, talk of entities without identity is either meaningless or, in fact, talk about something else altogether. Jensen, 2019. Likewise, Bueno has insisted that identity is too fundamental to be given up so readily and suggests that we can infer the non-individuality of quantum particles directly from their indistinguishability with identity itself understood as a useful idealization that simplifies our conceptual conceptual framework and allows us to predict the behavior of the relevant objects, in this case quantal entities. Bueno 2014, four responses see Ehrenhardt 2017 A and Krauss and Ehrenhardt 2019. Both the framework of quasi-set theory and the underlying metaphysics have been extended into the foundations of quantum field theory, where it has been argued, one has non-individual quanta, Teller 1995. A form of quasi-set theory may provide one way of formally capturing this notion, French and Krauss 2006, for concerns about such a move see Santa Anna 2019. It has also been suggested that this offers a way of understanding the sense in which quantum objects may be regarded as vague, French and Krauss 2003, although it has been questioned whether vagueness is the appropriate notion here, Darby 2010, and also whether quasi-set theory offers the most perspicuous way of capturing this sense, Smith 2008. Finally, for those who are leery of quasi sets and their attendant formal apparatus, there is also the option of returning to Wales' original insight, which underpins the quote above, and appropriating his idea of an aggregate. If this is interpreted non set theoretically as an equivalence relation, where the relevant elements are understood as simply objects that have certain properties in common, one can continue to maintain that such objects do not have well defined identity condi conditions. Bueno, 2019. Indeed, there may be a variety of such frameworks, both formal and metaphysical, in terms of which non individuality may be understood. Ehrenhardt 2017b. 6. Metaphysical underdetermination. We now appear to have an interesting situation. Quantum mechanics is compatible with two distinct metaphysical packages, one in which the objects are regarded as individuals and one in which they are not. Thus, we have a form of underdetermination of the metaphysics by the physics, see Van Frassen 1985 and 1991, French 1989, Huggett 1997. This has implications for the broader issue of realism within the philosophy of science. If asked to spell out her beliefs, the realist will point to currently accepted fundamental physics, such as quantum mechanics, and insist that the world is, at least approximately, however the physics says it is. Of course, there are the well-known problems of ontological change, giving rise to the so-called pessimistic meta-induction and underdetermination of theories by the empirical data. However, this underdetermination of metaphysical packages seems to pose an even more fundamental problem, as the physics involved is well entrenched and the difference in the metaphysics seemingly as wide as it could be. These packages support dramatically different worldviews, one in which quantum objects, such as electrons, quarks, and so forth, are individuals, and one in which they are not. The realist must then face the question, which package corresponds to the world? One option would be to refuse to answer and insist that all the realist is required to do is to state how the world is, according to our best theories, that is, to articulate her realism in terms of electrons, quarks, etc., and what physics tells us about them, and no more, metaphysically speaking. This might be called a shallow form of realism, Magnus 2012, and it raises the obvious worry that the content of such shallow realism amounts to no more than a recitation of the relevant physical content of our best theories, with no consideration of whether the content is concerned with objects or not, and whether the former are individuals or not. At the other extreme, one might be tempted to give up realism altogether and adopt an anti realist stance. Thus, the constructive empiricist, taking realism to be metaphysically informed, and hence deep rather than shallow, draws as the lesson from this underdetermination, so much for metaphysics and realism along with it. Since on this view, all that theories can tell us is how the world could be, the different metaphysical packages of objects as individuals, and as non-individuals simply amount to different ways of spelling that out, Van Frassen 1991. In between these extremes are various options for handling the underdetermination, corresponding to different levels of deep realism. Thus one might try to argue that the underdetermination can be broken in some way. One might, for example, appeal to some metaphysical factor or other in support of one package over the other, or shift to metaphysical considerations in order to argue, for example, that individuality based on weak discernibility has certain advantages over rival accounts and also over non-individuality, with its attendant non-standard formal underpinning. However, Ehrenhardt argues that weak discernibility generates further metaphysical underdetermination and hence cannot support a fully naturalistic understanding of quantum mechanics as some of its advocates have claimed. Ehrenhardt 2017b. Alternatively, of course, one could argue the other way and insist that the non-individuality package avoids having to choose between different metaphysical accounts of individuality, at least, and that the formal shift to quasi-set theory is not as dramatic as might be thought. Ultimately, however, it's not at all clear what weight should be given to the various factors involved,
The central argument for this claim focuses on the core understanding that objects may indeed be regarded as individuals in quantum physics, but as such are subject to restrictions on the sets of states they may occupy. The states that are inaccessible to the particles of a particular kind, such as electrons, say, can be taken as corresponding to just so much surplus structure. In particular, if the view of particles as individuals is adopted, then it is entirely mysterious as to why a particular subset of these inaccessible surplus states, namely those that are non-symmetric, are not actually realized. Applying the general methodological principle that a theory which does not contain such surplus structure is to be preferred preferred over one that does, Redhead and Teller conclude that we have grounds for preferring the non-individuals package, and the mystery of the inaccessible states simply does not arise, Redhead and Teller 1991 and 1992. This line of argument has been criticized by Huggett on the grounds that the apparent mystery is a mere fabrication. The inaccessible non-symmetric states can be ruled out as simply not physically possible, Huggett 1995. The surplus structure, then, is a consequence of the representation chosen, and has no further metaphysical significance. However, it has been insisted that a theory should also tell us why a particular state of affairs is not possible. So, consider the possible state of affairs in which a cold cup of tea spontaneously starts to boil. Statistical mechanics can explain why we never observe such a possibility, whereas the quantum objects as individuals view cannot explain why we never observe non-symmetric states, and hence it is deficient in this regard, Teller 1998. Unfortunately, the analogy is problematic. Statistical mechanics does not say that the above situation never occurs, but only that the probability of its occurrence is extremely low. The question then reduces to that of why is this probability so low? The answer to that is typically given in terms of the very low number of states corresponding to the tea boiling compared to the vast number of states for which it remains cold. Why then, this disparity in the number of accessible states? Or, equivalently, why do we find ourselves in situations in which entropy increases? One answer takes us back to the initial conditions of the Big Bang. A similar line can then be taken in the case of quantum statistics. Why do we never observe non-symmetric states? Because that is the way the universe is, and we should not expect quantum mechanics alone to have to explain why certain initial conditions obtain and not others. Here we recall that the symmetry of the Hamiltonian ensures that if a particle is in a state of a particular symmetry, corresponding to Bose-Einstein statistics, say, or Fermi-Dirac, to begin with, it will remain in states of that symmetry. Hence, if non-symmetric states do not feature in the initial conditions which held at the beginning of the universe, the universe, they will remain forever inaccessible to the particles. The issue then turns on different views of the significance of the above surplus structure. See Belisek 2000. Furthermore, even if we accept the methodological principle of the less surplus structure, the better. It is not clear that QFD understood in terms of non-individual quanta offers any significant advantage in this respect. Although C. De Costa and Hollick 2015 for an account in these terms of states with undefined particle number, characteristic of QFT. Indeed, it has been argued that the formalism of QFT is also compatible with the alternative package of objects as individuals. Van Frassen has pressed this claim, 1991, drawing on the Moin's construction of state spaces for QFT which involved labeled particles, 1975. Butterfield, however, has argued that the existence of states that are superpositions of particle number within QFT undermines the equivalence, 1993. Nevertheless, Huggett insists, in this case the undermining is empirical, rather than methodological, Huggett, 1995. When the number is constant, it is the states for arbitrary numbers of particles which are so much surplus structure and now, if the methodological argument is applied, it is the individual's package which is to be preferred. It is also worth noting, perhaps, that some of this surplus structure corresponds to so-called paraparticle statistics, or forms of quantum statistics that are neither bosonic nor fermionic. These were acknowledged as possible by Dirac as early as the 1930s, but were only fully developed theoretically from the late 1950s. For a brief period in the mid-1960s it was thought that quarks might be paraparticles, before the same statistical behavior came to be described in terms of the new intrinsic property of color leading to the development of quantum chromodynamics, which effectively pushed paraparticle theory into the theoretical twilight. For a summary of the history see French and Krauss 2006, CH3, for a discussion of paraparticles in the context of issues relating to particle indistinguishability, see Colton and Butterfield 2012b. This suggests that paraparticle statistics can always be redescribed in conventional terms, a suggestion that has been taken up by Baker et. Al in the context of algebraic QFT, thereby eliminating this form of surplus structure at least, Baker, Halverson, and Swanson 2015. There remains considerable scope for further exploration of all these issues and concerns in the context of quantum field theory, see also Yang 1995, and a collection of relevant historical and philosophical reflections can be found in Chao, 1999. A further approach to this underdetermination is to reject both packages and seek a third way. Thus Morganti has argued that both of the above metaphysical packages assume that everything qualitative about an object must be encoded in terms of a property that it possesses, Morganti 2009. Dropping this assumption allows us to consider quantum statistics as describing inherent properties of the assembly as a whole. The anti-symmetry of the relevant states is then accounted for in terms of the disposition of the system to give rise to certain correlated outcomes upon measurement. This is presented as an extension of Teller's relational holism, Teller 1989, and relatedly, the notion of inheritance involves the denial of the supervenience of the properties of the whole on those of the parts. However, as just indicated, it comes with a cost, that of admitting holistic dispositional properties, and the metaphysics of these in the quantum context requires further development, as does the sense in which such inherent properties emerge when systems interact. Earlier and along similar metaphysical lines, Levine suggested that quantum objects can be regarded as the smallest possible amounts of stuff and crucially, that a multiparticle state represents a further amount of stuff such that it does not contain proper parts. 1991, see also Jensen 2019. Such a view, he claims, avoids the metaphysically problematic aspects of both the individuals and non-individuals packages. Of course, there are then the issues of the metaphysics and logic of stuff, but it can be argued that these are familiar and not peculiar to quantum mechanics. One such issue concerns the nature of stuff. Is it our familiar primitive substance? Substance as a fundamental metaphysical primitive faces well-known difficulties, and it has been suggested that it should be dropped in favor of some form of bundle theory, as mentioned at the very beginning of this article. If the individual objects are understood to be bundles of tropes, where a trope is an individual instance of a property or a relation, and if this notion is brought in to include individuals whose existence depends on that of others which are not a part of them, then it is claimed this notion may be flexible enough to accommodate quantum physics. Simons, 1998. See also Morgani, 2013. Another issue concerns the manner in which stuff combines. How do we go from the amounts of stuff represented by two independent photons to the amount represented by a joint two-photon state? The analogies Levine gives are well-known: drops of water, money in the bank, bumps on a rope. Teller, 1983. Hess, 1963. Of course, these may also be appropriate appropriated by the non-individual object, object's view, but more significantly, they are suggestive of a field-theoretic approach in which the stuff in question is the quantum field. Here we return to issues concerning the metaphysics of quantum field theory, and it is worth pointing out that underdetermination may arise here too. In classical physics we are faced with a choice between the view of the field as a kind of global substance or stuff, and an alternative conception in terms of field quantities assigned to enhance its properties of, the points of space-time. In the case of quantum field theory, the field quantities are not well defined at such points, because of difficulties in defining exact locational states in quantum field theory, but are instead regarded as smeared over space-time regions, see Teller 1999. The underdetermination remains, of course, between an understanding of the given quantum field in terms of some kind of global substance and the alternative conception in terms of the properties of space-time regions. Taking the first option obviously requires a metaphysically articulated form of substantivalism applicable to quantum field theory. Many commentators have preferred the second option, but now, of course, attention must be paid to the metaphysical status of the spacetime regions over which the field properties are taken to be instantiated. Typically, these will be taken to be composed of points of spacetime and conceiving of a field in terms of a set of properties meshes comfortably with the approach that takes spacetime to be a kind of substance or stuff itself. But this too faces well-
Unfortunately, such a properties-based account of fields is difficult to reconcile with the alternative view of spacetime as merely a system of relations, such as contiguity, between physical bodies, if the field quantities are properties of spacetime regions and the latter are understood, ultimately, to be reducible to relations between physical objects, where the latter are conceived of in field-theoretic terms, then a circularity arises, see Rovelli 1999. One way forward would be to draw on alternative accounts of the nature of spacetime. Thus, Stahel has suggested that we drop the sharp, metaphysical distinction between things and relations between things and adopt a broadly structuralist view of spacetime, Stahel 1999, see the essays in Rickles, French and Sotsi 2006. Suitably extended, such a structuralist approach might offer a way around the above incompatibility by regarding both spacetime and the quantum field in structural terms, terms, rather than in terms of substances, properties, or relations. See Oyen 1995, Chow 2003, French and Ladyman 2003, Kontorovich 2003, Lyre 2004, Saunders 2003b. This takes us to a further possible response to the above metaphysical underdetermination, which urges realism to retreat from a metaphysics of objects and develop an ontology of structure compatible with the physics, Ladyman 1998 and 2014. An early attempt to do this in the quantum context can be seen in the work of Kassir, who noted the implications of the new physics for the standard notion of individual objects and concluded that quantum objects were describable only as points of intersection of certain relations, 1937p, 180. Setting aside the neo Kantian elements in Kassir's structuralism, this view of quantum entities has been developed in the context of a form of ontic structural realism, Ladyman and Ross 2007. Drawing on the views of both Whale and Wigner, quantum objects are here understood as ontologically constituted, grouped theoretically, in terms of sets of invariants, such as rest mass, charge, spin, and so on, Castellani 1998. From this perspective, both the individuality and non-individuality packages get off on the wrong feet, as it were, by assuming that the way the world is, according to physics, is a world of objects, which can either be regarded as individuals, whether primitively or via weak discernibility, or as non-individuals, whether formally represented through quasi-set theory or not. How, then, should we regard the indistinguishability postulate with which we began this discussion of identity and individuality in the quantum context? Both the above packages rest upon a certain understanding of particle permutations, as encapsulated in the postulate, namely that these are to be conceived in terms of swapping the particles between states, or boxes in our illustrative sketch. However, we can also think of the indistinguishability postulate as expressing a fundamental symmetry constraint on quantum mechanics, to the effect that the relevant states should be invariant under particle permutations. An alternative way of regarding this permutation invariance that aligns with a widely accepted view of symmetry principles in general is that it expresses a certain representational redundancy in the formalism. Thus, referring to our sketch above, the permuted arrangement of one particle in each box, which is counted in classical statistical mechanics, but not in the quantum form, can be considered as representationally redundant in this sense. This cast permutation invariance is one of a number of such symmetry principles that have acquired a fundamental role in modern physics, Huggett 1999b, French and Rickles 2003. Not surprisingly, perhaps, such a recasting may also have metaphysical implications in that when applied to certain systems obeying Fermi-Dirac statistics, that is, systems of material particles, the composition of such systems, in the sense that they may be regarded as composed or made up of subsystems considered as parts, violate standard Mariological principles, Colton 2015, for some possible responses see Vygodge 2016. More generally, it has been argued that permutation invariance is incompatible with a particle ontology understood even in a metaphysically minimal sense, Jensen 2011. Given the fundamental significance of the former, it has been suggested that the latter must then be jettisoned. A possible alternative is to adopt a form of spacetime substantivalism and take property-bearing regions of spacetime to provide the appropriate ontological basis, Jensen 2011. However, that runs into the sorts of problems touched on above. More radically, perhaps, dropping the above object-oriented assumption would undercut the metaphysical underdetermination entirely and open up space for an alternative ontology in terms of which quantum entities are conceived of as nothing more than features of the structure of the world, see French and Ladyman 2003. This can then be articulated in terms of the relevant laws and symmetries with the properties of such putative entities under understood as the determinate aspects of the structure, see French 2014. For further consideration of such an ontology in the context of structural realism, see Ladyman 2014. From